Well, hello and welcome everyone to another edition of Social Media Myths Busted and today our special guest is Neil Schaefer. He's here with us and I'm really excited, Neil, that you're here and going to share with us um, what you have taken away from social media and how you got started and how you um, overcame any myths, <laughs> busted through them to success. But first, tell us about you and what your business is, what you do with social media and how that came about. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Laura. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. So uh, who I am? Well, social media is my business in essence. Uh, I am a social media author, consultant, speaker. Uh, I, I run a blog. So uh, I've written three books on social media, two books on LinkedIn. My latest book is on social media strategy called Maximize Your Social. I also run a social media for business news site called Maximize Social Business. So I consult and speak and what have you. Uh, I started out in social media very organically. My background and whenever I speak on social media, I make it a point to tell people if you're going to hear someone coach you or speak to you on social, you should understand what they did before social, right? So if my background was PR, I'd have a different perspective than if I was in sales, for instance. So my background uh, is B2B technology, sales, biz dev, and marketing. And I have sort of a unique background in that I speak Japanese and Chinese, and I started my career in Asia for 15 years where I represented companies with no brand recognition that were trying to open up new markets. So that gave me this really, really holistic business experience, not only selling into these various communities, but also internally getting resources for my mission, which a lot of social media managers inside of companies, I think, can, can share the challenge. Uh, and really, it was 2008 uh, when I came back to the United States, and I was actually looking for a job for the first time in the United States, right? And uh, I didn't have a network because after college, I went straight out to Asia. So at that time, as a professional, uh, you know, what social media existed in February of 2008? It was pretty much LinkedIn, and it was just a, you know, a shadow of what it is today. But I realized that you know, I had a very, very specific objective, which was I wanted to build out a network, both locally as well as people in my industry. Very, very targeted objective. And I saw LinkedIn from that day as a business tool which slowly, six years later, finally more and more people are realizing that some people still don't. But anyway, uh, and um, it's funny because I have this attitude, of this networking attitude that, you know, the more I help people, the more, you know, my bank account of karma increases uh, and the more it's going to pay dividends. So I'd reach out to people. I'd connect with them. I started, you know, participating in LinkedIn Answers, which is RIP now, but and LinkedIn groups and, and really um, sharing the information that I had and when I connected with the people, hey, let me know if you have any questions. So I started getting a lot of questions. And I'm like, you know what? I need to do something with this. So I built a blog. In fact, I launched my WordPress.com blog on LinkedIn when they used to have these applications. Right. And that was July of 2008. And, um, you know, as it turns out, I found my job. And then the Lehman Brothers crash happened. And they said, you know, we're going to pull out of international sales. And, and I was in transition again. And my wife said, you know, you should write the book. Uh, because you blog so much about it. So I wrote the book in 2009, and as I was writing the book, I was known locally as like the LinkedIn expert, so I got invited to speak. And soon after the book, the speaking engagements began to be paid engagements. Uh, and then in January of 2010, a few months after the book and starting to speak, a few companies reached out to me saying, hey, we want to hire you as a consultant. Can you help us? And, and you know, since January of 2010, that's when I launched my social media strategy consultancy. And it's been four years now. I haven't turned back. So, you know, some of you listening might be a consultant or, or a speaker or an author, and I did it in reverse, right? Because I started with the book, then the speaking, then the consulting, because it happened very organically. I never intended to monetize my knowledge about social media, um, but the opportunities came and the industry came. And to be honest with you, in January 2010, I could have gone back to corporate in social media, but the value that businesses placed on social at that point was very, very low. They were looking for, and they still are, a lot of the time looking for interns uh, or, you know, uh, they weren't willing to pay for what I believe is a very, very strategic position inside most companies. So, yeah, uh, I haven't looked back. Love doing what I'm doing. Love, uh, you know, love and helping others. Even though I'm a consultant, I consider other social media professionals my colleagues, my customers, not my competition. So I'm very open in sharing information. And I love doing Google Hangouts on air because it's really the best and most genuine way of sharing that information. So I'm just happy to be here and happy to help out in any way to your audience. That's great. Well, your your story in having it be a backwards journey, it's like I'm writing the book, but I've had the consultancy firm for a number of years. So we're, we're two birds kind of traveling <laughs> together. I love it. And um, mm -hmm. 
in the beginning, was there any kind of resistance that you had to social media or to any particular social media network? Um, great question. So, and I, I tell this to my clients and other professionals, right? We are doing this hang on air on Google Plus. We're not necessarily using Google Plus as the network as much as as the layer, right? And you know, recording a hangout in air because we both have Google Plus accounts, and then we can put that on YouTube. And very similar, I saw social media as a business tool, and I learned very very early on not to take it personally. So why did I mention the Google Plus community? Because a lot of community managers and small business owners say, well, none of my friends are on Google Plus. Why would I want to be on Google Plus, right? Um, and that's a really dangerous assumption because you need to analyze each one as a tool. On the other hand, you know, I remember a few years ago all these young people saying, oh, you've got to be on Foursquare, right? Well, what is, you know, who's using Foursquare? Do, does that match up with our audience? Uh, and how can I use it to actually see tangible business results? So, um, and you know, talking about cracking the myths, that, that's what it really comes down to is an analysis of, of platform by platform. So I do not take any platform personally, and as a social media professional, I owe it to my clients to have a certain aptitude about all of the platforms so that I understand which ones they need to be on. So there was a point, for instance, where I deleted Foursquare from my iPhone. Uh, I've since reinstalled it. Um, but you know you, you need to um, have a certain aptitude and therefore when you stop taking it personally well I hate Facebook well you know Facebook is the yellow pages so if you're a business we you know if you've advertised in the yellow pages that's like advertising on Facebook in essence so you know when you think of it that way you gotta take the personal you can still have your personal friends and I know maybe you had a child that did something bad on MySpace or Facebook and, and they're still paying for it, but as a business owner or business professional, you need to take the emotions out of it and really, you know, I talk about maximize your social, you need to experiment, but you, know, you need to be doing it yourself and really look at it from a business, not a personal perspective. And I think once you can untie your personal emotions, you cut your personal emotions from looking at these social media platforms as, you know, as business tools like I did in 2008 with LinkedIn, I think it's really going to help shift your mindset to uh, one that you're, it's going to help you succeed in social media for business. So, so being open to the social networks is real important and taking, and I think you're pointing to not only um, taking the personal out, I love that, but you're also saying that we should definitely um, not buy into some of the misinformation or BS as some other people might say that's out there. Is there anything that people have bought into um, that is really you know, erroneous that you've you've heard that have taken people down the wrong path on social media. Wow, that is a great question. You know, I think um, seeing that I've known LinkedIn since 2008 and seeing, you know, internet marketers uh, say, hey, wow, I can like write a blog post and post it to 50 groups and, um, and, and it's actually those people now are getting blocked from LinkedIn groups. They're getting their accounts removed from LinkedIn. Um, you know, some of the other ones like Pinterest, uh, Pinterest is an awesome platform, and a lot of companies have seen real business results as a result of it. But I tell my clients, you know, go to Pinterest.com and look at all the different categories. If your product doesn't fit in the category, you're like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. There's better platforms you can be on. The whole idea about it, you know, from my perspective, the, the strategic approach to social media, the social media strategy is, or social media for business, is that you don't need to be on all the platforms. And deciding what not to do is almost as important as deciding what to do, right? So, yeah. you know, Google Plus at the very beginning was the same. Google Plus launched and all these people started doing all this stuff and it's like, you know what? You know, sometimes, you know, when I was in college, my senior year, I was actually in Beijing during the Tiananmen demonstration. So, my senior year thesis, I was writing and that sort of aged me. But anyway, my senior year thesis, I was writing about the role of popular music in the Tiananmen demonstrations. And my dad, who's an educator, said, you know, Neil, some things you need a historical perspective for. And it's, with social media, it's so true. You're going to see all these new networks appear and all this buzz, you know, Snapchat and, you know, hey, if you're Taco Bell and you're targeting a millennial or, or you know, the high school kids, um, that makes sense to be on Snapchat. But if you're like a real niche B2B company, you can just pretty much ignore it um, because probably the function, you know, getting brand awareness on that without audience is not going to help you win business. So it really, you really need to have an analytical, you know, mindset uh, so that you don't get taken down the wrong road uh, and you don't you know listen to someone's advice without thinking to yourself 
you know, is my, are, are my customers or, you know, people I want to reach out to, are they even using this platform? And are they using it in a way that would make sense for me to engage with them on? I think if you can ask, well, you know, once you get to that certain aptitude, I often say as a social media consultant, you know, I'm helping people cross the chasm, right? And once you cross the chasm, sure, there's, there's other additional value that I add, but by far the biggest value is crossing that initial chasm. And once you do that and you're able to analyze these platforms, and the funny thing is, the older people, talking about social media myths, you know, social media is obviously not just about millennials and young people, you know, we're all using it. And I find the older people, the people that are very, very well versed and experienced in business, once they cross that chasm, they not only cross the chasm faster, but they're more effective at social media marketing because it's just, you know, I like to say new tools, old rules. And that's what it really comes down to. And I think that they do the best in social media. So, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people in a lot of different backgrounds hearing this. And, um, you know, even if you have zero experience in social media, I like to say it's never too late. You know, I joined Twitter in November of 2008 thinking that I was late to the party. I joined Facebook in March of 2009 thinking I was late to the party. You're never late to the party. Yeah. And... So that makes me think now with Facebook, I get a lot of questions on, I need to advertise on Facebook now because Facebook's algorithm, blah, 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 is not showing my post. What role do you think Facebook advertising holds for businesses and realistically, should they be using it? Great question. So I, when I wrote Maximize Your Social, this is back in March of 2013, um, I wrote that and I called it paid social at the time. I think a lot of more people are using that term. but that paid social is one of the most underutilized aspects of social media that exists. And I still believe that right now in, in 2014. And the reason is you have a budget for social media that for most companies is people. It's not a lot of tools, and if, unless you're doing advertising, it's not advertising. But if you're spending an hour a day and your time is worth $100 an hour, for instance, um, you know, take, one, take that hour one day, do something more productive, and buy $100 worth of Facebook ads and see how much you can achieve with just $100, which I think if you manage your and optimize your ads, you can actually do a lot. Um, and the other thing is as businesses, how do you scale? Because social media is relying on people and, and, and someone on content, but it requires people to create that content. You know, advertising allows you to scale, right? That doing more with people does not. Uh, and that's another reason to use advertising. So fast forward, I wrote that in March 2013. December 2013, I was invited by Facebook to visit their headquarters and I actually interviewed the director of advertising. And it was a fascinating discussion. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, a little bit of advertising can go a long way. It's not a lot. If you've ever advertised on Google or in the phone book or in print media, I, I think that Facebook is damn cheap, you know, in all honesty, dirt cheap for what they offer if you understand your audience, you know how to target, your ad is right, and, and, and you know, and the whole bit. Um, now, fast forward to February uh, of 2014 when I was back in Japan, and, and I do business in Japan as well, there is a very, very uh, popular social media platform there called Line. Line is like a Skype, it's a, it's a mobile, well, it's on the PC as well, but it's really a mobile-only app. Line, and you know, I remind people, social media was made for people, not for businesses. You know, Facebook, although it may seem weird to people, they have a user-first mentality, okay? If, if, if users are not going back to their Facebook news feed, they're going to lose out on the users and they're going to lose out on everything else. So there's just too much content, right? And the algorithm has always been changing. It's always been in flux. Um, it, it's now getting harder and harder uh, with more and more people, more and more content, more and more businesses trying to promote the content. So what Line did, and Line now has 300 million users um, which, you know, in, for a Japanese social media app that where Japan only has a population of 125 million. Um, and, you know, one company that I featured in my uh, book on, uh, you know, Maximize Your Social is a Japanese convenience store called Lawson. Uh, they're like a 7-Eleven. They have, you know, they have their million fans on Facebook, but they have 3 million fans online. And when they do a campaign, the ROI from line is like 10x of Facebook. Now, the interesting thing I want to talk about and I'm actually writing a blog post on this, Line is a 100% pay-to-play platform. Because it was made for people, if businesses want to have an account, they have to pay a monthly fee, and if they want to send a status update, they have to pay per user uh, or per follower that they have. For the, but even despite that, that Lawson has a much higher ROI 
on their activities online than an organic slash paid platform, which is Facebook. So I believe social media is, is going to become more pay to play and the price of advertising and the effectiveness of that advertising is only going to go, the price is going to go up, the effectiveness is going to go down, there's never a better time, you know, invest 20 50 a hundred dollars um, I think every company should have a if you're gonna do social media marketing you have to have a paid social part of your budget now whether you do that on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn there's a lot of different ways of, of, of you know splicing and dicing that budget but yeah if if I wanted to try to get um, results from Facebook uh, Facebook advertising would definitely be part I'm not saying hundred percent but definitely part of, of what I would do with it and I, I'm sure you'd agree with me Laura right I'm sorry. I do, and the biggest question I get is about, um, oh. okay, what do we advertise? Do we do likes? Do we do offers? Or do we do links to our pages and what's going to produce the most results? How do you advise clients? So I, I look at, um, you know, social media marketing in general is the same, but you, you, you nailed it with these different types of advertising you have. One is just getting, you know, brand awareness, which is the Facebook likes. If you're just starting out on Facebook, I recommend you do that to try to get to a to a a certain you know number, whether it's 100 or 250 or 500, a thousand, whatever your your goal is. Then when you compare yourself with your competitors and you want to sort of keep up with the Joneses, it's another way to sort of complement your own organic growth. Um, so if you want to get to a thousand by the end of the year and you're at 950 December 15th, why not you know? pay to get those additional 50 likes to hit your objective. I think it's it's an easy way and you're you know the thing about likes that people forget is you're not buying fans. Fans that are very very relevant to your advertising parameters are opting in and you're basically injecting your community with new blood. Um, and obviously, you know, if we understand the way that algorithms work and I'm not even going to say the word edge rank anymore because even when I was at Facebook, they said that they never called it edge rank internally, but it's an algorithm like Google, right? Um, either way, the fact of the matter is that, you know, people that just join your page, you would think would have a little bit higher affinity than old fans who have never engaged with your page, right? So there's another reason to always have that fresh blood come in. So that's buying likes. Now, Promoting content. Promoting content is a great way just to, rem it's, you know, you already have people in your community of reminding them that you're there because with the algorithms, uh, fewer and fewer people are seen and, and it's going to be even fewer over time, trust me, um, and just reminding them. And I think it's a best practice in social media marketing maybe once a month of promoting a post just to remind, you know, it has to be relevant, it has to be engaging, but just to remind people that you're out there and to, you know, continue to, to maintain a certain amount of, of uh, engagement and I'm not going to say to sort of dupe the algorithm, um, but it's almost as a best practice, right? The third type, like a Facebook offer or a Facebook ad with a specific click-through, which is revenue generating, I mean, that's the holy grail of the social media ROI. And yeah, you should be doing those as well. So, you know, each of these are for different purposes, but that's where you're really going to get a feel of, you know, I have a thousand fans, we're a brick and mortar store. How can I utilize these fans to try to generate real revenue for my community without offering them something? You're never going to get something, right? So the Facebook offer is a specific, a specific way of doing it. There's tons of you know third-party apps you can use to offer campaign, you know, excuse me, coupons or refer a friend. So there's a lot of different ways of doing it. But yeah, that's something you should be doing on a monthly basis and make those offers attractive to the Facebook community. Um, you know, realizing your users and what content they engage with. Um, and, and make it relevant and you know I think companies have uh, I just read today and uh, maybe I'll send you the link of you know a small business that spent you know twenty five dollars on ads and and was able to achieve seven hundred dollars in revenue for like a brick and mortar store that only gets like a thousand dollars a month from new customers I forgot what the what the number was but it just goes to show I mean even for the very smallest business a little money can really go a long way but yeah that's you know I would not skip the Facebook likes and the promoted post ads just to go for the jugular, which is the you know the, the, the call to action ads. I think it's it's even better once you have a more engaging community and once you're not asking for people's business. Once you do that, you're going to be a lot more effective. Yeah, because I find one of the myths is people say, "Oh, I'm having an event in three weeks. Should we do some ads?" <laughs> Not necessarily, right? Not, not, necessarily. not if they never built their fan base up or have any quality content or have pe to, to walk people through um, a funnel where they get to know them and get, get an experience of them. So, hey, Laura, I, I have a great one. I have friends reach out to me, hey, I'm doing a fundraiser. 
or a Kickstarter? How do you recommend I use Facebook because they see me as a social media expert? I'm like, I'm like, don't, you know, don't, you're going to lose your friends. It's going to be seen as spam. If you want to try to sell a product or, um, you know, try to raise money, what have you, the value is not in the people that you know who would support you. It's in the people that you don't know, right? Those right. are the people that we reach out to. And that's why, uh, you know, acquiring Facebook likes is an awesome way of doing that. Uh, but, yeah, the minute you, the minute you get 1,000 fans, you start to just blast them day in and day out with your call to action. Uh, people are going to leave really fast, right? <laughs> Yeah, you got to offer remarkable content and then they're going to want to give back to you, right? That's just human nature. We got to remember we're humans first. I love that. Um, and we're here. Facebook is called Facebook for a reason, right? Indeed, indeed. So um, was there anything personally you had to overcome to get social media to work for you? Um, well, I think everybody who does social media understands that you need to become really, really good at time management, and you really need to look at the time you invest in every social media-related activity that you do, and what is your return on that. Sometimes you simply got to cut loose. And now, I talked about having a presence in all these different social media platforms, and as social media professionals, we all do. But the amount of time you spend on each one, you determine, and and you need to be looking at that uh, often because we're, you know, the social media audience is sort of this moving herd of people or, you know, swarm of birds uh, that changes, right? Uh, and you want to make sure that you're investing your time correctly. So yeah, um, the other one is, and I uh, I wrote about this. I wrote a blog post about the, you know, the six social media trends of 2014. A lot of people and a lot of brands spend too much time engaging when I think they should be creating more really unique and compelling content. Um, it, I mean, if you're a well-known brand, great. You can do all the engagement you want. But if you're a small business, you know, for, for all the time you spend engaging, I think a lot of that can be better used if you're creating better content. And if you're a, you know, if you're a B2B brand, obviously, it's, it's pure content. If you're a consumer-facing brand, it could be photos or videos, right? It's not just... You're not talking about getting people to download your white paper, join your webinar for your consumer-facing brand, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of different types of content, you know, memes and uh, and things you can be doing that I think your time would be better spent than just in the peer engagement. And that's I find that for me as well, and that's something I'm trying to you know further tweak uh, here in 2014. And if you're creating that great content, you are in effect enhancing your engagement by nature exactly. of that. Yeah. Exactly. So. On, on a much bigger scale because then if it's content that's indexed by Google, yeah, I mean, you, you get the picture. Yeah, exactly. And, and so do uh, hopefully our listeners today. So, so too. yeah. So let's just leave people with some advice. What, what would you tell somebody who's new or, or they just crossed the chasm as a result of our conversation here today and your advice? Um, they crossed the chasm. They're ready to play a bigger game and get out there on social media. What advice do you have for them? Wow, that's a... It's a pretty broad question, but um, just thinking of my own work with my own clients, number one, you need a website. Social media does not replace anything. It complements everything. With that in mind, you need to have a website, and I highly recommend that you consider a blog for that website. Now, even if you're a consumer-facing brand, you can do a Tumblr blog with photos, what have you, but really, with social media and with um, you know, you don't own the IP uh, that you have on all these social networks. It's important that you're able to bring people back to your home base where you control the branding, you control the message, and you can, you know, showcase whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it. So that is more important than ever. And if you're a small business that doesn't have a website, or one of my favorites is you built your website 10 years ago, all these people from Facebook and Twitter or LinkedIn come to your website and they see a user interface that it feels like they're back in Windows 3.1, you're immediately going to lose people. It's immediate like, you know, this, this company doesn't speak my language. I mean, that's, that's how important that user interface is. So you may want to revise and rebrand your website in alignment, but that's, you know, the first thing of, of infrastructure that you need um, in order to get started. I'd say the second thing is really think about content. At the end of the day, um, you know, a lot of engagement is done through content that you either create or curate, right? Or that you decide to engage in um, uh, proactively. So really think hard as to not what content you want to promote, but put yourself in the shoes of your target customer and think about what content they like to engage with, especially in social media. Right. Uh, and I think that'll give you a good start as far as the content. And then we have the platforms, right? And you don't, you know, start start small. 
If you're consumer facing, start with Facebook. If you're an e-commerce store um, that targets a female demographic, and I'm gonna say at this point, forget about Facebook. Just do you know, just start with Pinterest. If you're a B2B, start with LinkedIn. Um, and I think these are, you know, as far as great places to start, um, this is what I'd recommend. If you're a brick and mortar, consumer facing, um, there's Facebook, but you know, you could almost skip to Instagram. Um, for some for some people something to consider um, but really find your one platform and try to make that work and do it for three months and I think that you know look at your analytics and your Facebook insights and figure out what worked and what didn't and and hopefully that'll give you a good start but you know what we talked about social media was made for people it's about relationships it takes time to get to know people in fact the older we get the more time it takes to get to know someone, right? Mm -hmm. Think of all the friends you have from high school. How many new friends do you make a year as you get older? It's probably less and less for a variety of reasons, right? Um, and social media is no different. It takes time. You're not going to get results overnight. Some are lucky and do, right? Um, and some, you know, go from here to here because they built up that platform. There's this pent up, you know, demand for engagement, and then they come in with the right piece of content or offer at the right time and. Boom, you know, the Will It Blend example. Um, but, but, but it took time and it took a lot of planning and, and, and resources to get there. It doesn't happen overnight. Don't be, that's another social media myth, right? Don't be fooled by that. You know, take time, but realize having a social media presence is like having a website. It becomes part of your infrastructure over time. And that's really the, you know, the, the mindset that if you have, I think you'll do really well. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think your wealth of knowledge. And tell people how they can find you and read some of these blogs you were talking about that you've been writing. Sure. Well, my personal and, and sort of personal slash business website is MaximizeYourSocial.com. You can actually, uh, yeah, I guess I'll take it off the bookshelf there. This is uh, my book, Maximize Your Social, which uh, came out uh, in September of 2013, which um, is about social media strategy creation. It uh, actually covers a lot of the advice that I offered uh, in this uh, in this hangout as well. Uh, and then the Social Media for Business uh, website, uh, the blog I have is called Maximize Social Business. That's where I primarily blog, and we have 20-something other you know regular contributors there as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean... Um, Either way, and, and Neil Schaefer, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Neil Schaefer, and you hopefully can see how to spell my name down here in my lower third. Um, you can find me anywhere, and uh, if there's any follow-up questions, you know, please reach out to me, connect with me. I'd be, I'd be more than happy to help. Great. Thank you so much. I love your book. You're an Thank exceptional you. resource, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. So Indeed. have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.